I was going to uh, interview someone about crypto, so uh, you're going to have to just put up with me. H how many of you are interested in crypto? Wow. So, so th the subject of this is the promise of crypto. That's the, uh, that's the title of this conversation, the promise of crypto. So the question is, w what is seductive about crypto? What's, so to speak, keeping you all up? What's intriguing you? Why is crypto such a signi significant piece of our digital imagination and increasingly our digital architecture? It's not a side note, it's not a footnote. It's increasingly important. The introduction suggests that it's a financial instrument, that it's a piece of a new financial system emerging, which of course is true. There's no doubt about that. When we think of crypto, we think of blockchain-based currencies, peer-to-peer -peer currencies, currencies operating on a Web3 protocol rather than platform. But I think there's something more to that. We need to think more imaginatively about the promise of crypto, because that's what's intriguing you, that's what's intriguing so many pioneers, so many idealists, and indeed concerning skeptics like myself. What is the promise? I'm always wary of promises. Some of you may know some of my work. Uh, over the last 15 years, I've been one of the major critics of Web 2.0. So when everyone was speaking about the promise of Web 2.0, I was warning you of its perils, the perils of a disintermediated media where everyone has a voice, the perils of a winner-take-all digital economy of companies like Facebook and Google. I used to be in a, in a fairly small minority. Now it's kind of annoying and rather boring because everyone's saying the same thing. So is the promise of Web 3 the same as the promise of Web 2? Is it a great seduction? Is it a hype? Is it a scam even? Uh, is it something that is being cleverly orchestrated by a group of smart technologists or investors or simply players on the internet who are taking all the money and run? There's certainly some aspect of that as the events over the last couple of weeks have shown. Um, but I think there's something broader about the promise of crypto. As I said, it's very much bound up in this thing that we're calling we. It's not really me, and I don't quite know who came up with the term. Web 3. The significance of Web 3 is it isn't Web 2.0. It's the next chapter, the next step. What's different in the imagination of the architects and visionaries behind Web 3 is it offers a new internet. Uh, Don Tapscott, who's probably uh, the most articulate, he sometimes comes to DLD, the most articulate guy on this front, suggests that crypto or blockchain is the new internet. So what makes it new? Why is it so promising? Why is it so seductive? The reason is because it offers, and, and perhaps this is one of the reasons why crypto is so seductive with young people, it offers a version of the internet without power. It offers a version of the internet which is purely distributed. A trustless version, there was a Web3 uh, uh, panel earlier this morning, which speaks of a trustless internet. The reason why you no longer need trust in crypto in Web3 is because everything operates on the blockchain. Everything is absolutely visible. We don't need to trust anything or anyone. As one of the founders of Ethereum suggested, trust is replaced by truth. Now, truth, of course, is a very controversial word these days in our so-called post-truth society, which again explains why crypto is so compelling, why it offers so much promise. It offers certainty because blockchain is certain. Blockchain, of course, is a, a public ledger which can't supposedly be tampered with. Um, it's truthful rather than trustworthy. It can't be changed. Now, crypto operates on the blockchain in the sense that it's a centerless currency. It has no 
Bank of England that has no Federal Reserve. It has no central authority. Uh, the essence of blockchain, of course, um, is premised on the idea of a DAO. Many of you have heard this term. It's increasingly the central term, the metaphor, and also a concrete reality of what Web3 supposedly offers. DAO stands for Decentralized um, Autonomous Organization. Now that may sound rather clunky. It might sound as if it could have been invented in Brussels by some faceless bureaucratic committee. But when you think it through, it suggests a profound revolution. You remember at the beginning of the, well, none of us can actually remember this, but it, as historians, we can remember at the beginning of the 20th century, Max Weber argued that the great challenge to individual freedom was bureaucracy, was state power. Well, the DAOs and Web3 offer to change that. They offer to free us from hierarchies. They offer to free us from top-down organizations. They offer to free us, of course, from the dominant Web 2.0 companies, which have become these very chilling, surveillance-style capitalist companies, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples, the Microsofts of the world. So the promise is immense. The promise is a currency in crypto, which is essentially our currency, a people's currency, a currency not controlled or owned by the bank. It's radically democratic. Now, we've heard those terms before about radical democracy. For those of you around at the beginning of the Web 2.0 age, we heard about the radical democratization of media. Everyone would have a voice. Everyone would become a journalist. Everyone would become a videographer. Everyone would become a writer. We no longer needed the mediating institutions, the publishing houses, the movie studios, the radio stations. This was supposed to create a long tail, radical democratization of, of culture. Of course, the reverse is true. Rather than the long tail, we got Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Rather than the long tail, we got the ubiquity of Google, and so on and so forth. We don't need to go over that again. We're all very familiar with what happened with the mistake. So the promise of crypto, the promise of Web3 is this time, we're going to get it right. This time, we're not going to fuck it up. This time, we've learned from our mistakes. This time, we can rely on an effective technology which will indeed do away with the central authority of a bank, of a recording studio, perhaps even of the state, of government itself. That is the promise of crypto. That's the promise of Web3. It's a very radical, seductive promise. So the question, of course, the interesting question, is not the seduction. Those seductions are always out there. You only have to open a magazine. You only have to look at a half-naked photo of a woman or a man to realize that seductions are to a penny. The really interesting thing about great seductions, the really interesting thing about the promise of crypto, it is, is it real? Is it just, isn't, is it, is it uh, just another scam, another way of making fast money? It's an interesting question, and above all else, I think it's bound up in the question of power. Now, um, reality rules is the thesis, the theme of DLD this year. But you'll note, and uh, uh, you'll note that. It's followed by two things, an exclamation mark and a question mark. So Steffi, as always, is having it both ways. She's asking the question and making a statement at the same time. And we can apply that, the idea of reality and Web3 in an interesting way. Firstly, as an exclamation point, and secondly, as a question. As an exclamation point, it's compelling, as I said. Imagine a world where technology frees us from hierarchy. Imagine a technology where we all own our currency. Imagine a technology, a coin-based technology, where there are no mediators, where everything is owned by us. 
But of course, that sounds almost too good to be true. And I think, unfortunately, like most things about the internet, it is. The first flaw, I think, of the crypto revolution, and this is very similar to what happened in Web 2.0, is we fall into the great seduction of believing that technology can fix human problems, that technology can solve problems which have existed throughout the history of our species. And it's simply not true. The idea that crypto or Web3 can do away with power is actually quite absurd and very dangerous. So rather than the promise of crypto, perhaps we should be talking about the perils, the dangers of crypto. Because we've been through this one time before, when we talked about the democratization of media, when we talked about Web 2 freeing us, giving all of us a voice, we have, of course, become the product. We are the ones who are paying, quite literally in our data, for the enormous wealth of the Zuckerbergs of the world. So how can we lose out in the crypto age? We can quite literally lose all our money. And that's happened to many of the young speculators who quite literally have no idea of what they're putting their money into. But I think there's something bigger and even more dangerous about crypto and the Web3 revolution that is very chilling. Mike Butcher touched on it this morning. I don't know if you saw his conversation with a venture capitalist. Because there are two things going on simultaneously. And that underlines or should underline how chilling all this is. It's a deeply surreal situation. On the one hand, we have a situation where blockchain and crypto and DAOs are supposed to liberate us, do away with organization. Money itself becomes a liberating financial force. It's almost as if Marx came back to life and rewrote Das Kapital uh, from a crypto perspective. This fetishization of money. It's not really a discussion of money. It's a discussion of philosophy. On the one hand, huge amount of money is being poured into this by venture capitalists, particularly in Silicon Valley, where I'm from, by venture capitalists, the smartest of all of them. There was a guy here this morning with Mike Butcher. Mike asked him, you're putting all this money in. How are you going to get it back if it's supposed to be so democratizing, if everything is a DAO? Who owns what? Who owns the cryptocurrency? No one owns Bitcoin, in theory. No one owns Ethereum. So that's the first thing that should warn us about the peril rather than the promise. There's a huge win here for the money. The money is usually right because the money is usually controlled by the smartest people in the room. And the smartest people in the room tend to be people like Mark Andreessen. So what are they betting on with crypto? What are they betting on with Web3? They're betting on something even bigger than Web2. Now, you remember in the Web2 age, they bet on Google as a search engine. They bet on Facebook as a social uh, media platform. They bet on platforms. They bet on YouTube as a video platform. They bet on Uber as a, a cab, a mobility platform. They bet on Airbnb as a, a travel platform. They were betting on verticals. Sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. That's the nature of venture capital. The smartest, won, the, 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 the smartest investors win 20 or 30% of the time. Uh, the less smart ones win maybe 5% of the time. They know that they're betting on platforms. The interesting thing about Web3, and it's not being articulated yet, and this is why it's so chilling, and this is why the promise of crypto is outweighed by its peril. Is there betting? And Mike talked about this this morning. You need to be careful when you listen to this language. Because as all well reminded us, language is everything. And when these people throw around words, you need to think carefully. What do they mean? This morning they talked, they, the venture capitalist, who, interestingly enough, said, I'm not an investor in money. I'm not interested in money. I'm interested in people. Whenever anyone says that, you know they're lying. 
you know that the money in their heads is going round like a like a, 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 a roulette wheel. They're imagining their vast fortune. So what is the vast fortune here? There are two words that are being thrown around in this shift from Web 2 to Web 3. From platform of Web 2 to protocols of Web 3. What's happening with Web 3 is the very architecture, the plumbing of the internet is being redone. It didn't work the first time around, or it didn't work in the sense that it created the problems of Web 2. Now, sometimes plumbers come in if a toilet, uh, to use a rather vulgar metaphor, if a toilet uh, overflows, plumbers can fix stuff. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But what is being replaced here with crypto and Web3 are new protocols. And what these venture cap, so they're the underlying operating system, the horizontal rather than the vertical nature of the internet. So they're playing for even bigger stakes. And that's not S-T-E-A-K-S, that's not meat stakes, that's money stakes. They're playing to own the world because these people are greedy. That's the nature of their business. That's what venture capitalists do. They're, de de they're defined and driven by greed. And what they're trying to do in owning these new protocols which operate the crypto world is essentially own this new operating system. It's a very important thing to bear in mind because they wouldn't be pouring huge amounts of money into this thing if, it, if there was no money to be made, if it was just some sort of democratic new currency which we all own. So the fear, and this is something that we need to bear in mind, we being the DLD community, people who are a little bit more suspicious and critical, who aren't going to drink the Kool-Aid, who aren't as vulnerable to the great seduction of these things as the kids online who buy up these coins and, 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 and lose fortunes because they have no idea of what they're investing in. We've been through this before. Mark said, first as tragedy, then as farce, back in the 19th century, about a different kind of political upheaval. This time, though, the tragedy of Web 2 the tragedy of Google and Facebook and surveillance capitalism and the fact that we've been turned into the products is even more chilling. So whilst there is promise in crypto, I don't deny that, there are attractive qualities in it. It offers perhaps a way out and even the biggest, the most um, religious uh, pro uh, uh, supporters of, of Web3 and crypto will tell you, well, we're not entirely sure what it is. No one really is entirely sure what it is. We don't even have a Tim O'Reilly who coined the term like he did with Web 2.0. But this stuff is inevitable. It's unavoidable. Huge amounts of money are being poured in to rearranging the architecture, the plumbing of the Internet. Who owns these new protocols? Who's going to make money? Who are going to be the winners and the losers? In the past, it's always us, the people, who have been the losers. Web 3, like Web 2, was articulated in the name of the people, like so many other events throughout history. I fear that Web 3 will end in an even more tragic way than Web 2. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah.